Yeah, that was good. <laughs> good morning. Let's begin with prayer. Our gracious almighty God, I, uh, I come to you as a weak servant of yours. And I pray that whatever words I have are your words. Whatever I've studied, Lord, I pray that you will filter those to your Holy Spirit. And that um, whatever I say, Lord, is reflective on you and it brings you honor and glory and never me. Lord, um, I thank you for your word. I thank you for John and Melanie. I thank you for the leadership that's here and I thank you for the body that worships here at Thrive. Lord, bless each of us that in everything we do, we can continue to seek your will in our lives. Lord, be with us as we walk with you and as you live inside of us. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Jonah. Well, I titled this The Interrupter because all I could think of is God continued to interrupt journeys. And um, just to talk about the concept of God interrupting us, and I'll be mentioning that several times this morning, is I thought of Paul on his way to Damascus and how the Lord interrupted his journey uh, very dramatically, and he ended up changing his entire life because of it. And um, also, I thought of a story that uh, I didn't think of until yesterday. I couldn't even think of the name, then all of a sudden everything came back to me. Um, it was about in the early 1970s. Uh, I met a man, his name was Clyde Thompson, and um, he was called the meanest man in Texas. He had killed, um, murdered five people. First one was in uh, uh, the early 1920s, and it was a, uh, he was hunting with some friends, and he got in an argument, and he ended up killing um, someone. Sent to prison, life, um, and then uh, they changed it to, um, um, to death. And while he was in prison, he was involved with an uh, escape, and this was kind of ironical. Um, the man he was escaping with was the husband of, you know, Bonnie and Clyde. It was Bonnie's husband. You may not know that Bonnie was married before when she was with Clyde, but, and they ended up killing a man there too. I won't go through the rest of his killings, it's bad. He was on death row three times. And uh, um, they never really commuted, they just changed things. And then finally, um, he was literally to receive the electric chair. And because he was so mean and they were so afraid, they ended up um, a year before, as he's waiting to, to die in the electric chair, they sent him to the morgue, and that's where he was confined for the year, totally by himself in the morgue. And while he was there in the morgue waiting um, the electric chair, a handicapped woman heard about him and sent him a Bible. That's the only thing he was allowed in there. With a very dim light, he began to read the Bible. It's an unbelievable story, which I just read yesterday. They're making a movie about it, and it would be a wonderful movie. The bottom line is two to three hours before he was going to the electric chair, the governor commuted his sentence because he was against death in the electric chair. He read that Bible, and uh, through many years, he converted, he accepted Christ, he changed his whole life, and he began reading and growing, and um, when he was up for parole the first time, it was denied, 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 and eventually this woman who sent him the Bible really worked with the governor and other people, and he was finally given parole in 1955. He immediately went to Bible college, received a degree, uh, started teaching everywhere he could. Of course, his special ministry was really dealing with prisoners. And of course, he couldn't do that, and the governor eventually saw his life and how he was changed so much that the governor literally pardoned him from five murders. And he ended up starting a prison ministry, ended up becoming a chaplain and that's where Daryl and I, my friend and I met him because we were starting a prison ministry and we spent several hours with him. My goodness, what a man. I was in tears just listening to his story. By what happened to him and all the prison ministries that he started in Texas at that time, literally hundreds, maybe even thousands of people accepted Christ because of what he had done. God interrupted his life. He interrupted his life three hours before he was to be killed by the electric chair. Jonah. Jonah was interrupted several times. Jonah was a well-known prophet to the Israelites, spoken of in 2 Kings 14 and other places. 
but his name was specifically mentioned there. And he was a, a prophet to the nation of Israel. And as God, he was speaking God's messages to the people. And, but he had always spoken, he was a prophet for Israel, to Israel, and he was never asked to go outside of that role until we see beginning in Jonah, beginning uh, chapter one, verses one through three. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness had come up before me. But Jonah ran from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. You know what's interesting in this is you know what the name Jonah, what it means? It means dove. What do birds do when they see, see or uh, are aware of danger? They fly away. Jonah flew away. He was, um, he left. Why did he leave? Well, my goodness. Um, he was being asked to go to Nineveh. Nineveh was not, they were not Jewish. In fact, they were the enemies of the Israelites, totally. And they were so bad, um, the Assyrians, and this was a capital, it had about 120,000 people. And they were, they were so evil. And the Israelites hated them. Oh yeah, Bibles, I'm sorry. Um, if anybody needs a Bible, raise their hand. <laughs> I'm sorry. And again, um, if you don't have one, feel free to take it home, because uh, we're gonna be talking about a lot of scriptures today. Thank you. All right, this uh, Nineveh was so evil, you cannot imagine. We have some stone carvings during this time. And um, they were so bad that they would not only go in and destroy whole nations that they were enemies with, but they would do just horrible things. They would cut off the heads. They would put the heads on pedestals. They would make, use the skin of, it, it, I won't even go into it because it's, it's too much. It, the evil and as I was reading more and more from these stone carvings, it just made me sick, I'll be honest. Because it wasn't just simply that they were bad. I mean, they were literally evil people. Jonah, obviously, this was, this was the enemy to the Jews. This was the enemy to the Israelites. And it wasn't just their enemy. These people were evil. And can you imagine? Going somewhere that, first of all, Jonah probably thought, okay, Lord, I might, if I go there, I'm probably going to die. And um, I don't want to go there. I don't want to speak to these people. I don't want to have anything to do with them. It's funny, um, in the book of Nahum, it even talks about Nahum as he was walking through the streets of Nineveh. He was hearing swords clashing, sounds of whips snapping, and chariots rattling through the streets, not caring who they ran over in the midst of all this. Nahum says... It was a city busy with violence, deception, idolatry, and ready for God's judgment. So Jonah ran away. Let's look at um, verses four through 17. Then Jonah, uh, excuse me, then the Lord sent a great um, wind on the sea and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell deep into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us, and, we'll, and we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to see and find out who's responsible for this calamity. As we know, God used the concept of casting lots several times in, in the Bible. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us who's responsible for making all this trouble for us. What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? And he answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them. And they asked, what have you done? because they knew he was running away from the Lord because he'd already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then the Lord, excuse me, then they cried out to the Lord, please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. 
Notice they were praying to the Lord that Jonah was, had spoken about, not to their gods. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. And at this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. And now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Point one, when God interrupts your journey or your plans, you need to listen and obey. Jonah was blinded by hate and also something else. I want to talk about the hate a little bit more that I've already mentioned. Um, and he was also running away from something. You know, where he was going to is interesting. He goes down to this port, and there are many ships there. And one of the ships was clearly probably going to Nineveh, but he took the ship going as far to Tarshish, which you can't imagine. Nineveh was about a day's journey by ship, and Tarshish was 2,500 miles away. And there was even a feeling during this time that Tarshish was kind of out of sight of God. Of course, it wasn't true, but there was this kind of rumor that that was so far away, it was the opposite end of everything known, and if he could go that far, maybe he would leave God's sight. So he was running. Have you ever run for something that God has called you to? Maybe because you were afraid. Maybe because he simply called you to do something, but you're, you're holding off. You're not, you're not following through on what God is calling you to do. Maybe he will interrupt your journey. And pray that if he does interrupt your journey, that you'll realize that God is interrupting your current path, that maybe you've taken the boat to Tarshish when God wants you to take the boat to Nineveh. What is your Nineveh? What are you running from? Because when God interrupts your journey, take that as a sign that he probably wants you to obey. He wants you to go and take the boat that he's called you to do. Just to use that uh, example, you know, there are many boats, oftentimes God is calling you to do one thing. It could be things like, maybe there's somebody at work that you realize for a long time, God has been calling you to talk to this person about the Lord. Or maybe you've got someone who has really sinned against you or done something and you're afraid to go to them and you haven't done that yet and he's calling you to do that. But each time you go to do that, something happens and there's a different boat to take. And God will interrupt your life where he'll put you in a place where he still wants you to obey, but it's your choice. Are you going to obey? Are you going to take the boat to Nineveh or the one to Tarshish? How easy it is, is it to turn from your hatred? God shows love, and basically Jonah was, basically Joseph, Jonah was a racist also. These people were just evil, and he wanted them destroyed, and he, going to them was so far out of bounds. He loved his comfortable life as a prophet. He was highly respected. It was an easy life. He was God's messenger, and now God is telling him to do something that's very hard. I'm going to go to point number two now. God may send you where you do not want to go and ask you to do things you do not want to do because our lives must be about serving God. I just want to let you know that there's a Jonah in all of us. And the moment that you think it's a wonderful story and that, oh, I would never do that, think again. I can guarantee you that there's been some time in your life that you've been on a journey and maybe you've been interrupted and you still continued on the journey, not on the one that God wanted you to do. That old saying, you can run, but you cannot hide. I often think when I think of this particular thing, how... Jonah ran away. It's almost like, you know, the kids when they're like um, under five years old or even younger, they like to play the hide and seek game. You ever seen that? You know, where they're doing this. And as soon as they do this, they think that um, you can't see them because they can't see you. So in their minds, it hasn't quite got to that point of something being abstract. So when they do this, you've disappeared. And so that's why when, you know, when they take their hands away and they, oh, they're all excited and laughing because all of a sudden you appeared out of nowhere. I guess that's what Jonah thought. And yeah, let's put a little levity in this. It's like Jonah thought he could put his hands over his eyes and that God wouldn't see him. And how childish that really was. 
There's a second thing involved with this, and that is that Jonah really thought he could control his life. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. God is in control, and we are not. This was a lesson that Eve should have learned, but she did not. In Genesis chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Now the serpent was craftier than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? It's really a play on words because um, God did say that you can eat from any tree in the garden. And then he went on to say eat from these trees. But he was really just playing a word. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden. But God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and here's the key thing, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That's kind of Jonah to some degree. He thought he was in control of his steps. He thought he would be able to dictate what he was going to do not realizing that it's truly that's God that's in control. That saying, and I think I've said it before, is uh, if somebody ever asked me, you know, what is the one thing that you learned about your whole life in Christianity, and that is that there is a God and I'm not him. Eve, Eve did not learn that, and Jonah was in the midst of learning it. Let's go to Jonah chapter 2. In my distress, I called to the Lord, this is as he was in the fish, and he answered me, from deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said I have been banished from your sight, and yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me, Seaweed was wrapped around my head. The roots of the mountains, I sank down. The earth beneath barred me forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you. Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with the shouts of a grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. And I have vowed what I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish to vomit Jonah on dry land. I want to tell you it's sad that Jonah had to go through this. God interrupted Jonah's journey to Tarshish. And uh, Jonah just simply wanted to die, just throw me in. Rather than even now that he realizes this is God that's doing this, I'm not going to get to Tarshish. I still want to just end my life. I want you to think about this for a minute. The fish was not bad. The fish saved Jonah, obviously. Now you might think, boy, he put him in a really bad place. And this is what I thought about in the story of my friend when he spent that time in a morgue waiting to be, go to the electric chair. And uh, in a way, God saved my friend while he was in the morgue waiting to go to the electric chair. And that woman sent him a Bible which gave him time to read it, to change. God interrupted that man's journey. God interrupted Jonah's journey. And while he's in the belly of that fish, he gave Jonah time to think about what he had done. That you can't run from God. God is in control. And no matter what he does, God is there. And so he repented. And he changed. I want to tell you that getting into the right boat to begin with is pretty important. And how can you be assured that you will get into the right boat? I want to suggest three ways. When you're faced with decisions and you're not sure which one God is calling you to do, but you want to be sure you're going to get into the right boat, first of all, your relationship with God, your intimacy with God through prayer is number one. If you want to make sure that you are responding to God's calling and you're not running away from it, pray. Number two, Read the word. Apply the word with your life. And the blessing is not simply knowing. The blessing in reading the word is taking it in and doing it. Number three, 
make sure you are with a community of believers. You know, Jonah, when he went down to that boat and he ended up getting in a boat, there were no believers in that boat with him. And that's a tough place to be when you're having to make decisions. Be with people who are you're walking with in life who will hold you accountable, who will come to you when you have made a mistake, who can say, you know what, you're going in the wrong direction. And they may be able to interrupt your journey so that God won't have to. So spend time with people in a community like here and Thrive, especially in our Thrive groups. Point number three. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return to him. That's a quote from 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 9. And I just thought it was a good one. Jonah turned back. God is, he, he repented, he turned back. He's gracious and merciful and will not turn his face away from you if you return to him. In this regard, that Jonah is very much, in fact, many people think that the possibility when Jesus told the story of the prodigal son, that he was actually thinking of Jonah. Because you remember that first son, he told the father, he said, give me everything that I need right now. Give me, every, give me all my inheritance now. And then he took it and he ran away. He did not want to live that life that his father had set up for him. So he ran away. He lost all of it. He realized what he had done. See, very similar to Jonah. He tried to run away. He realized he couldn't. He realized the situation in the belly of the whale. He repented. The prodigal son repented, changed, went back thinking, you know, just let me be a servant. Let me eat with the pigs. And his father said, no. And I love this in Luke. Luke chapter 15. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring the fatted calf and kill it, and let us celebrate. For this was my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and he's found. And they began to celebrate. He realized that he made a mistake, Jonah did, and he returned to God. Point four. God will be patient with your weaknesses, and always ready to save you in unexpected ways when you turn to him. When he interrupts your journeys, and just like he saved Jonah by the fish, he will provide ways for you to turn to him. He will provide unexpected ways. Your flight might be delayed when you're going somewhere you shouldn't go. Maybe your car, you're on your way. Maybe you've got a relationship with somebody you know God doesn't want you to have a relationship with. And you're on your way and you get a flat tire. Small things, big things, but God will interrupt you. It's just that notice it and be sure to respond with obedience. And he will be patient, but only so long. He wants you to return to him. He wants you to take the boat to Nineveh. How many of us think, uh, um, again, in other words, I guess what I'm saying is, don't get to the point where God is interrupting your journey and he's gotta save you like you saved Jonah with a big fish. Or like my friend going to the morgue being a couple hours from, um, you know, from, from death. Jonah, um, see, I'm going to skip that part. Okay, I want to look at um, verse 17, that last part we just read. And it said, now the Lord provided a huge fish, a uh, huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. I just love that word, God provided. God will provide if we are aware. All right, let's go to chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Then the, Lord, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the city of Nineveh and proclaim it, the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by uh, going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. 
That's all he said. Look at that. It's eight words, and in Hebrew, that's actually only five words. Now, some people say that's all he said. They were so evil that they realized their situation. Other people said, well, no, he probably spoke a whole lot more about who he was. But regardless, they responded to Jonah's message from God. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth, and when Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not eat. Let them eat or drink. But let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. It's interesting, the animals too. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, they relented and did not, uh, he did not bring them on the destruction as he had threatened. So Jonah obeyed the second time. There's a big message about God giving us second chances, but I want you to think about something. In the first part of Jonah, we have Jonah um, being interrupted in his journey to run from God, very much like the prodigal son. So he responded with the interruption by trying to run away. And then eventually he um, repented. In the next um, part, we have the sailors. And the sailors is the key part of this. Their journey was interrupted very clearly. The sailors were simply going to probably ports to sell goods or whatever, and their journey was drastically interrupted by the Lord. And uh, their ship was about to crash. And when they realized um, the situation they're in and what they had done, what did they do? They repented, they turned away from their gods. Not only did they turn away from their gods, they began to worship Almighty God and make vows to Yahweh. And then now we have this third chance of, um, uh, of Nineveh, the city of Nineveh. City of Nineveh, so you have jo Jonah's journey interrupted, you have the sailor's journey interrupted, and now we have the city of Nineveh who was destined for destruction by the Lord. Their journey was interrupted, and they also responded positively believing in God and repenting. And I want to make a point with this, especially about the city of Nineveh here. Point five, godly sorrow, which leads to repentance and obedience to God, can be difficult and sometimes painful. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse, uh, well, excuse me, yeah, chapter 7, verse 10. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly uh, grief produces death. In other words, the people of Nineveh, they may have quickly realized that what they were doing was wrong and may even be sad about it, but the difference was that they responded to God. There's the godly grief. And there is a huge difference between the two. You can be really sad that you did something. You hurt somebody's feelings. You said something you shouldn't have said. You lied. You, um, you sinned in who knows what. And you may be very sorry that you did that. You may even go to that person and talk to them, but the reality is that if the grief is not a godly grief, that it is meaningless. You need to turn to God in that grief, which is what the Ninevites did. Obedience can be difficult as Jonah saw. God gives us second chances as he did Jonah, but just because we have repented and are ready to obey does not mean the road will be easy. But it begins with God helping us. After God interrupts any journey in a wrong direction, he is there to guide you to repentance and obedience. Remember, he gave us the Holy Spirit as our helper in following God's desire for our life. See, there's a huge piece to this, is now we have something Jonah did not have. We have the Holy Spirit within us. So just as God may interrupt your journeys, he doesn't just simply you know, tell you, you need to be following me in this other direction. He's given us the Holy Spirit. If we'll believe it and access the Holy Spirit's within us to go towards God. I wanna to go to chapter four, beginning with verse one. 
But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, was when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in the shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give him shade for his head to ease the discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's, Jonah's head so that he grew faint and he wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. Can you imagine Jonah was so angry at what God had done in, in relenting and not destroying these, in his, Jonah's mind, these evil people that he hated. They were enemies to Israel and he hated them. And he can't imagine how God would forgive them. They're pagans. And God relented and didn't destroy them. Jonah did not learn that there's not only a God, but Jonah's not him. Jonah's not in control. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry at the plant? And he's, it is, he said. And I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have concerned about this plant Though you did not tend it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight and died overnight. And you should not have concern over the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals. Point six. Accepting God as the creator means you accept that he determines your steps and the world you live in. All right, I want to make now... Four people, four responses. But before I do that, I want to talk about Jonah. Who does Jonah in this last part, who does Jonah remind you of that's in the New Testament? It's the older son now in the prodigal son story. Think about it a minute. The older son, you remember how upset he was when he saw what the father had done? You've given him all that? And what about me? I've been faithful. I've stayed here and I've tended your flocks. I've done everything I needed to do. And look what you did for him. It's just like Jonah. Jonah was just like the oldest son now. Is all the things that God had done for him. He saved Jonah's life. And, and now Jonah's angry? The older son was angry at the father? You're kidding me. Jonah being angry at God for this? So we've got four groups of people or individuals. We've got Jonah twice, and we've got the sailors, and we've got Nineveh. And I want to talk about those for a minute, and I want you to see if you can relate to any of these. As God interrupts journeys or plans that you may have that may be going in a wrong direction, you have four kinds of responses. One, you can be like Jonah's in the first place, and you're going to try to run away. You're there, and you've got choices, and you've got all these boats, and you're taking the one that's the farthest away. You've got choices. You know that God has interrupted your journey and you, you're, you're not going to do it. You refuse. You're going to go another direction. You're going to try to kind of flee from God and you think, well, maybe God won't see me. I know that God wants me to not look at these things on the internet, but you know what? You're in the privacy of your room. It's one o'clock in the morning and you get on the internet anyway. And then you, oh, I shouldn't have done that. We really think somehow, it's as stupid as it sounds, as stupid as it sounded, Jonah did this. We do the same thing. We think we can just simply run away from God. He won't see me when I do this, but he will. Or number two, you're like the sailors. Journey was interrupted, and you were not even worshiping God, or you were worshiping your version of God, and your journey was interrupted, and you realize, whoa. So... This is what God wants to do. And so you end up realizing this is the journey that he wants me to go on. And you immediately repent, just like the sailors did. And you put away those things, those idols, whether it's, whether we lie, whether it's money, whether it's drugs, whether it's um, 
uh, relationships, you put those away very quickly. In other words, just simply turning to God, but you put away those things that's been taking you away from that path, like the sailors did. They were worshiping all these other gods. And they realized, whoa, there's one God. And Jonah told them about him. And they believed it. And when they saw what, what they had done, when Jonah went in the water, and they even asked God to forgive them. And they prayed to God Almighty, Yahweh. They didn't pray to their gods. They turned immediately to God. And God saved the whole ship. Number three, the city of Nineveh. Are you like the city of Nineveh? Now, Nineveh is kind of interesting. Because you think, well, isn't Nineveh just like the sailors? Yes and no. Initially, Nineveh turned after Jonah had given the message and the Lord did not destroy them because they repented. But a hundred years later, they had fallen into the same situation. In Nahum chapter one, verse eight, the Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust him, but with an overwhelming flood, he will make the end of Nineveh. He will pursue his, so, his foes into the realm of darkness. Nineveh was destroyed a hundred years later. So they repented for a while. They're like that soil where it was just uh, planted and it was a very weak soil. So is that what we do? Do we end up changing and then all of a sudden we keep going back? So are we like Nineveh? And the last one, Jonah's final response. Like the older son in the prodigal son story. Do we expect that God, we've done all this thing for you? John has been preaching about this a lot lately in Samuel. Do we expect that if we do all these things for the church, and I'm involved with, I think John said, 10 different things we're doing at Thrive, does that mean that we, uh, we can disobey God? Does that mean we don't accept that God is the one that's in control, that God is the one that matters, that's serving him? It is not simply doing things. Jonah cannot be saved by him being a prophet to the Israelite nation. He can only be saved by obeying God. God wants, what did John say in the last couple of weeks? He wants us to obey, not just sacrifice. This is the, the, uh, the last Jonah, the older son. So are we like that when God interrupts us? To where um, we're like, well, wait a minute, God, you can't do this. I've done all these things for you. And so it's like, you're supposed to destroy Nineveh, I mean, excuse me, you weren't supposed to save Nineveh God, you were supposed to destroy it. Jonah is not God. There is a lot here in the, um, in the book of Jonah. Much more than I covered in this um, short little lesson. But I can tell you that um, God has interrupted my life many times. And I'll bet right now you can think of times when he's interrupted yours. That you were going in a wrong direction. How did you respond? And I can remember the few times when, I, when we did trust that God was there. I remember um, that when we were getting ready to go back to Saudi Arabia, I got the phone call that I'd been kicked out of Saudi Arabia. And I still remember, what am I supposed to do now? You know, and it was like almost as if, God, you, you're not here. I've done all this stuff. I've gone to Saudi Arabia. I was even talking about going and, and preaching to the Bedouins. And Lord, you kicked me out. It's like I was determining what I was supposed to do. And I was kicked out of the country. And so I just prayed. Now I did pray. So that part I guess was good. And then we also fasted. But what was interesting is that praying and fasting and I was still grasping at straws and it began, I'm thinking, it's funny, the feeling is I'm such a failure. It's like, I think there were feelings that sound strange of almost wanting to die. I had my family depending on me and now all of a sudden I'm kicked out. Like, who am I? And what's interesting, in the midst of all that, then we get a phone call um, to go to this school and interview. And then as i interviewing at this school to be a high school principal, I meet with the board as a Christian school. And I ask the board members, you know, well, why did you wait so long to hire somebody? And they said, because we were waiting for you. They had prayed, I may have already said this, forgive me if I have. They had prayed four months earlier that somehow there would be a missionary who was also a qualified secondary administrator. And that's who they wanted to hire. And I just, tears started streaming down me and all the board members started crying too because God wanted me there. How do we respond when God interrupts our journeys? And I'm not talking about just simply physically going on a journey. I'm talking about, example, 
Maybe you're, one, you're a young person here and you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. And maybe, um, maybe God is leading you to this person because you know this person will make you a better person. It will make you a stronger Christian. Or maybe in your mind you're thinking, in the back of your mind, well, I really love this person, but, um, and maybe God wants you to take another direction. And maybe he's showing you another direction. Seek God in, those, in all of our relationships. And here's the thing. He will interrupt you if it's not the direction he wants you to go. Look for those interruptions. They may not be as drastic as the stories we've told or even Jonah. But I can guarantee you there's going to be interruptions. There's going to be boats to choose. Choose the one going to Nineveh. Don't choose all the other boats that our society would love for you to choose. We got so many temptations going on right now in our world. But choose the boat that God has called you to, to serve the way he's called you. If the, the band would come up, we're gonna be having prayer in just a moment. And there'll be um, myself and Eric and Kevin will be around and also others. And I do, this is really important. There was a lot of things in this message, but one of the things is probably the most important of all. And that is that, um, God has given those who accept him the Holy Spirit. God has given not only those who accept him the Holy Spirit, but he's given you a relationship with him that will last for all of eternity. And some of you in this room may not even be a Christian. I don't know. But if you're not a Christian, maybe today is the day that your journey's been interrupted. Maybe today is the day that you will go the direction and take that boat to Nineveh. You will do what God is asking you to do. You will accept him as your Lord and Savior. Accept that he is in control of your life. And when you have that acceptance that you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he is the, um, is the one that is controlling your life, you accept him as your Savior for the forgiveness of your sins and you begin to walk in his way and then the Holy Spirit will come in you and I'm telling you, then you have a, um, something inside of you that will help you make the right choices and the right boat to take. So if you haven't already made that decision today to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, now is the time when you can do it. Maybe today was the day that God interrupted your journey in the direction you were going. So um, I'm going to pray and then the band is going to play and then um, Again, you can go to someone else. You don't have to go to one of the leaders. You can go to someone that you want to in the room. But prayer is that number one thing. If you want to make sure you're always taking that right boat when God's interrupting you, boy, it starts with, with your relationship with God and through prayer. So pray with me, please. Our gracious almighty God, we're just so thankful that you are there. Lord, we know that you are interrupting our lives on a continuous basis, and we just ask that we that we will respond and we will take the journey that you want us to go on and not be afraid knowing that you are with us. And Lord, if we're in that stage right now where we're actually in the belly of the whale or the fish and we're making the decision, you understand our weakness, Lord, and help us in our weakness that we can turn to you and obey what you are showing us to do. So Lord, be with us today that whatever journey you've given us, whatever interruption you've put in our path, that we will change the direction and go to you. And it's through Christ we pray. Amen.